All right, everybody, we have a very special guest today on with us. Uh, if you've ever, I don't know if you can not see him online, <laughs> uh, anything on Instagram, social media, TikTok, YouTube, you name it, anything in the Airbnb and short-term rental space, uh, Michael Elefante, did I pronounce that right? I nailed it. Do you go by Mike or Michael? I go by both. Michael okay. sounds fine, yeah. Perfect. Uh, we, I appreciate you coming on, taking a little bit of time, and you know, we were chatting a bit about the whole idea of the abundance to get podcasts and why we do this. And there's tons of podcasts out there that ask about, you know, how'd you get success and what did you do and the tips, tricks and all that. And that's great. Uh, but what we want to kind of start off with is diving into how maybe giving back and helping others, whether it's through your student programs where you're helping teach this stuff or through its philanthropic efforts, passions that you maybe in your family have I'd like to dive a little bit into that. Is there any kind of, are there any kind of, philanthropic things, passions, foundations, things that you have most passion for right now? Yeah. So I think the past three years I've been really focused on sharing just knowledge around short-term rentals and real estate and how I believe it was the fast path to financial freedom for, it can be for a lot of people, for us it was. And I want everybody to experience that at a younger age and I have to wait until they're 60 or 70 years old. So whether that you started through social media and then it started a couple of years ago, also through um, free coaching, which turned into an online coaching program. And now it's grown into a very in-depth, hands-on uh, coaching program to help people achieve similar results and and break free of the nine to five and, and really chase things they're passionate about through the rest of their life. So that's number one. I just want everyone to be able to experience that for as many years of their life as they can. Um, and then secondly, something my wife and I would like to do in the very near future, more on the philo, um, like side with working with kids probably mostly you know and i think she has some passion to also work with veterans but for kids um, i would love to help instill financial education um, just in general and help them be more entrepreneurial um, to help you know just kind of keep the american dream alive for what i what i truly believe it is and um, teach them what they do not get in school and maybe don't you know probably don't get it at home so i don't know what that looks like yet but probably love to start small and then and then my network has grown considerably and I'm sure yours as well by doing social media doing these types of podcasts so I'd love to get an awesome network together to where we could provide that type of education for for kids for free yeah I feel like we need to have a, a talk about this because you're not the first one I've thought about it and it's it, it, it aligns with the entrepreneur entrepreneurial person right the person that's in the B or the I quadrants right if you look at Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrants and understanding that in order for financial freedom, in order for people to experience that earlier in their life, they have to get into one of those two quadrants. They have to be a business owner or an, or an investor or a combination thereof. Because if you're sitting in as an employee, right, working for the man or you're self-employed, meaning you are the man, but you basically own a job now, <laughs> you, you have to find that way to where you actually have free time. And you're basically versus trading time for money. And it's not taught in school. And you, I mean, you touch on that. And I hear that over and over again. There was another gentleman, uh, Terrence Murphy, that's a good friend of mine. And, you know, former Green Bay Packer wide receiver, played with Aaron Rodgers. And I had him on the podcast several months back. Same thing. He has a massive passion for helping young kids and students with things they're not getting in school. And I'm baffled why our basic K through 12 or at least maybe when they get into high school, I don't even know when it starts. They're not teaching this entrepreneurial mindset, this, hey, you don't just want to go get a W-2 job. Maybe look at like starting businesses and this is how you do it. And this is how you would manage money and finances and understanding the flow of money and how you really truly do gain financial wealth and freedom and all that. Um, yeah. Do you sense that a lot? In the, I mean, I see that so much and everybody I talk to similar to you that has this mindset says the same thing. I want to teach people this financial freedom thing so they're not stuck in the cylinder of the W-2. Yeah. Well, the word abundance, which you know you mentioned a couple of times, that's what you guys are all about, is there's there's just a lack of knowledge. And even for me, I, I got bewildered each of the past like three to five years. Each year I realize something is possible or I learned something new that is just like I didn't even think, couldn't even fathom at the time or, or several years ago, you know, uh, whether that's with real estate or starting and owning a business and whether it's an online business or whatever. And 
each year, again, I learned something new and I'm like, I just can't believe it's possible. Then it happens in my life. And then looking back, it's just, it's just wild. And, and, and in people online too, are, are not shy to comment a lot of, you know, negativity, but it's, I think it's just a mindset thing. They don't know what's, it's possible for them. Uh, yeah. and I'm just a super normal guy. Um, and, and I think that's an issue with like just celebrity social media and just seeing people on a screen is you think it's just like, they can't fathom that their life could, that could exist for them too. Right. Even though it's 100% possible. So yeah. And I, and that's, in, go ahead. I was just going to say, like you mentioned in K through 12, you know, finance is one thing, but I also think it's a, a lack of instilling a creativity or creative mindset in children. We get away from that very soon, you know, um, especially when you're young and your mind's all over the place. Like that's when the, that's the time to like explore and, and like, then just be creative and, and try new things, start new things, maybe start a little business, you know. Uh, but we're basically taught from fifth grade on to show up and do what we're told, go home, work on an assignment and turn it in the next day, go to sleep and repeat. Um, and then you do that again through college. And then that's what makes you employable because you basically spent the first 20, 25 years of your life doing exactly that, showing up on time and doing what you're told. So, Yeah, it's interesting. And it's not that you don't, you can't do well as an employee or even self-employed quadrants. It's just a matter of what are people's goals and what is their passion? And that's why most people, I think 90% of the population sits in the W-2 side, right? As an employee working for someone. And I saw some great quote the other day. It said, you know, your W-2 income is somebody else's passive income. <laughs> I thought it was great because it makes sense, right? Because they're a business owner They've hired you and you're their passive income. And then you're sitting there getting pissed off because you're having to show up nine to five or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you have, if you get more creative employees that have, even if they're not going to be a business owner someday, if you had like, those are the best employees or best people who can help run your company, right. Or like be your COO essentially, are people who have an entrepreneurial mindset where they can take a task and do it better than you can do it. Or mm. say, hey, we should be doing this instead. Take the company this direction. And then they take it and run with it. Um, so you can absolutely be a really successful high income earner as an employee while still having kind of that mindset if you don't want to, if you have just no interest in starting and running a business. So I think there's yeah. definitely a blend between the two. Now you have kids, right? Yes. No. Nine month old daughter. You have nine month old daughter. Okay. I was going to say, because if she's a little older, I was going to say, you know, if you were to sit her across this camera or even across the table with you. And I asked her what she thinks of her daddy. What would she use to describe? Um, obviously she can't do that yet, <laughs> but what about your wife? If I sat her across the table, what would she say are your best and worst traits? Um, I think I'll start with the worst. I think she knows I'm a little bit of a scatterbrain. I'm not very organized. And I come to find that most entrepreneurs are not very organized. The ones that I typically, you know, um, not very organized and she usually tells me things like two or three times and then I'll ask the same question that she's like I already told you you know so that's like that sounds like a typical man 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 Man. yeah that's what she says exactly (laughs) um and then I think some things that I do well is just like I'm driven I'm also very um, family oriented like my goal is not to be a billionaire and be away from my family my goal is to make as much income as possible to support the the life I truly want to live and then the, the things that I want to do, right, or give back and be part of my community. But I do not want to sacrifice time. That's the biggest thing. Right. Um, so I, I just want to live a kick-ass life and um, I'd love to just lead, lead the charge in that. And uh, I think she appreciates that about me. And, and we both share the same vision. So I'm just a very driven person when it comes to that. Now, who would you say has been your biggest influence? Because like, you started in 2019 with the Airbnbs. Is that right? Okay. Who would you say has maybe been your biggest influence at a young age to where when you started in 2019 with the Airbnbs to make that impact? Anybody you can think of firsthand? Nothing really in terms of Airbnb or real estate. Um, I mean, my parents certainly just growing up in a two parent household with loving parents, they're very supportive. They were always there at sporting events, even at like practices or help coach teams that I was a part of. Um, so I think just being an athlete and being a part of teams allowed me to develop a mindset early on to deal with failure 
and deal with adversity and be able to still take the next step. Like there's always room for improvement. So I think that bled over a lot into the things that I did beyond college. I played baseball through college beyond my employment and then starting to invest in real estate and eventually become an entrepreneur. So I think it was Where, those base characteristics and growing up in a household like that. Where'd you play baseball at? At Elon University. In North okay. Carolina. Yeah, I did. Um, I was getting ready to go to U, uh, U of A, University of Arizona, and went out there for a weekend, um, toured the school, um, was going to be signing with them. And then my dad said, hey, you know, why don't you come back home for the weekend? Let's think about it before you make that decision. And then lo and behold, I was blessed get uh accepted in pepperdine um so of course i was like uh <laughs> i didn't get any kind of baseball thing but i walked on the team uh and tried to play uh from a walk-on perspective but they were just too good i ended up riding the pine never even getting far with it at all but it was always a passion of mine so that's good that you actually made it and you played and uh did you go anywhere beyond that into the minors or just college no, this is actually a funny story, which I usually tell on uh, you know different types of podcasts. Is um, I redshirted a year. I went in as a catcher, and I could throw hard, and I, I knew where it was going. I pitched a lot growing up, so I was doing a little bit of both pitching and catching my freshman year. Fall of sophomore year, I felt a pop on one throw, and immediately knew it was probably my UCL, which if you know Tommy John surgery. So had that happen, redshirted a year, then uh, came rehabbed as a full pitcher only, so full time pitcher. Um, so I pitched the next three years and I was, I had some interest. I was hoping to get picked up. Um, but I had some injuries back and forth and probably lacked consistency, truth be told, but that's what I wanted to do. So graduated with the finance degree and I was deciding if I wanted to go into the workforce or go back to school for a fifth year. And I was trying to pick up some internships or just some work part-time, full-time, whatever it was down in Florida. And nobody would hire me. Like I even, it came down to Chipotle or Dunkin' Donuts and Chipotle. (laughs) I love it. And Dunkin' Donuts hired me and I was just looking to like at least pay for gas and food during that summer I figured my life out. So I was there pouring coffee for like 7.35 an hour with like a 3.4, 3.5 GPA from one of the top business schools in the Southeast. I'm like, what am I doing? Dude, that was messed up. (laughs) <laughs> it is what it is. You know, anyways, I was like, you know, I'll just go back and play a fifth year. And I mean, that's a good humbling experience, right? I mean, that's yeah, something. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's, it's pretty wild looking back on it. That was my first taste of sales, too, because I was selling for a startup company, pre selling a product that's probably not even HIPAA compliant. It was super, kind of a weird product. And I was, I didn't know what I was doing, no guidance. I was just going door to door. I made my own pamphlets. I think I got t- two meetings that whole summer. I made zero dollars <laughs> doing that. So that's why I worked at Dunkin I love it. D's. Went back for a fifth year. Did okay that year. I was hoping to still potentially get drafted. It didn't happen. Took a job, entry level sales, making thirty five thousand a year, and that was like my first real smack in the face. Like I was super passionate about baseball. Like I mean, just like you, Justin, right? And once that passion came to a halt, I mean, I woke up living and breathing sports, spe- specifically baseball, for the better half of two decades. And then I was like, well, I got to do this. I was like, okay, great. I heard you can make money in sales. Like it'll be fun, right? It looks cool being an adult immediately miserable like they sat me down cold calling 70 to 100 people a day strangers trying to score meetings for products i didn't even know what the heck they were now um, did well in it but i just remember driving home in dallas i had just moved to texas in my car and sitting in traffic i just felt numb like i felt nothing i was like is this depression i was like i don't think i'm depressed but i had no money like i barely could save like more than a couple hundred bucks a month and i just had no feeling and i'm like is this what it's like like this is the- wow you know, so uh, pretty down on myself at the time. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get a part-time job. So I side hustled, poured wine. Uh, I was a sous chef a little bit at a vineyard about like 45 minutes north of Dallas in a town called McKinney. And I actually made more there post-tax than I did pre-tax at my job at sales, which is which is kind of messed up. But um, then I got a promotion and then I switched and networked a ton. I uh, got a job at Google doing inside sales for their cloud platform. Thought that I was like, I made it. I remember doing a project in school about what it's like to work at Google. I was like, wow, that must be nice. Went to work there. It is pretty, pretty cool. Like they treat employees really well. But at the same time, I just had this emptiness inside me. So I'm like, wow, okay. I thought I made it again. And here I am having the same feeling. Maybe if I just make more money, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll feel better. So this is when I started to learn about real estate and passive income because I'm started to see the, the silver lining here where 
it doesn't matter how much I'm making as long as I'm trading time doing something that does not make me happy every single day, then it won't. I won't be happy. Sure, life gets a little better and easier if you're making more. Um, so I got my last job I had before I quit and just did real estate full time. Um, moved from Dallas to Austin, then to Nashville. Stayed at an Airbnb to, while my wife and I were looking at homes for us to buy for ourselves. And that's when I started to think, how much money are these people making from us renting here just for a couple of days? What's their mortgage? How many days did they book? So that's what got the gears turning. Took that job. Finally was making six-figure income as a sales rep. Hated it, you know. Uh, but it was better. Life got a little easier. Uh, but that's what got the gears turning with real estate. And then a year later, made our first ever investment and then just never looked back. Gotcha. Kind of a long, long answer to your question. But. No, but it's a great one. And what would you say is the number one thing, obviously there's several, in a successful Airbnb? Well, there's multiple things, but the number one thing is, I'll just call it experience, right? You have to be in the right location and then also right location within that market because people are doing two things when they're looking for, to rent a place. What am I going to be doing in that city? And I want to be close to that specific activity. But most importantly, it's a, it's Airbnb is like a digital product. It's no different than Instagram. If I don't capture your attention in two seconds, you're on to the next 7,000 properties, right? Right. So I want to compete on experience in order to one, make more money per night and be more occupied. And two, I want to be relevant long-term. There's some articles coming out recently about how ref par is down a little bit and quite a bit in some cities. And it was, exactly. yeah, I saw that too. We'll, we'll talk on that in a minute because I did see that. It's very interesting. Uh, I'd like to get your take on it. Yeah. So it's getting more competitive, right? There's more supply. I think supply and demand will level out over time. But whatever happens in business, regardless what business it is, if su um, supply goes up, it's going to bring prices down, right? That's the beauty of a free market. And same thing with the short-term rental industry. And a lot of people are overpaying for places. So I don't want to compete on price. I want to compete on value and experience. So if you, you ask me the number one thing, it's, it's that. So it's design, amenities. What do people are, what are they going to feel when they're there? Why do they want to rent it for themselves or their families? What are their kids going to be doing? Um, and if you can sell them on that value, you're going to get more bookings at a higher rate, more frequently, better reviews, and just continues on and on. And how many do you own currently? We own seven and I have a management company. We manage about 230. Okay, gotcha. Now with the seven, from the first to now the one you have now, what have you learned the most about that process? Because you clearly have gotten better and better over time uh, to refine it. Yeah, design. Um, I think early on, and not just design, but a lot of things. Early on, like any real estate investor, you're trying to be really scrappy out of the gate. Um, oh, I could just do it myself. I could do that myself. Um, honestly, the more things you can outsource, as long as there's an ROI correlated with it or a return on time, so ROT, whatever you want to call that, um, then I'm willing to pay for that. Um, and so as time has gone on, our design has gotten better. We've outsourced design. Actually, I'm a part owner of a design company as well. Um, and those girls are amazing. Can they do it all over the country? Coast to coast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Summer led designs. Um, they're amazing. You guys listening, check them out on Instagram. The work they do yeah. is so killer. And all they do is vacation rental short term. And what do they typically run on an average, sorry to interrupt you, on an average Airbnb design? And do they purchase the furniture? Or what is the inclusive package with that? Yeah, there's two different routes you can go. They could do completely remote where they design the entire house to the photo frames on the walls and where to put them. And they give you a, a packet basically on a silver platter that you can take or you can hand to a GC or a project manager. And they'll, they'll know exactly each room, where to place things, how to do it. And then oh, wow. You procure the furniture and install. That's worth its weight in gold. Oh, it's amazing. And you'll do it in like two weeks. Turn yeah, I mean, it's worth its weight in gold just because you're not having to conceptually come up with all this. And I'm going to presume that they're good designers to where they are staying within trends. They're coming up with new concepts, things maybe that are ahead of the, you know, the curve. They kind of, like you said, keep your place relevant, keep it fun, create the experience, which sounds like that's everything. And I would agree with that. I mean, I... We don't own Airbnb, so this is kind of like a multifamily guy talking to an Airbnb guy, which is amazing, and we can chat about that because there's benefits of both. Um, but I have looked into it. I am curious about it. Uh, maybe I'll even talk offline with you about it, but it's uh, I, I do have concerns about you know ordinances, right? Crackdowns, supply. If you have lower barriers to entry, now you have all these people coming in, driving prices. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I'll dive into that 
one second, and then they just want to finish the second package with them. They'll they'll procure the furniture. You just give them money. They'll procure everything, and they'll professionally install and photograph. So wow. I've had clients on the coaching side where they live in Columbus, Ohio, and they set up a property in Scottsdale. They, a year ago, they still never been to it. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Beautiful property. Uh, That's amazing. But yeah. So as far as a couple different markets you can invest in, right? I mean, two traditional markets for, for short-term rentals. The one that most people think about are vacation markets. So mountains, beaches, lakes. There's been vacation rentals there for decades, right? Long before Airbnb or even the internet came about. Um, what Airbnb did is really made it more accessible for people to do it in the cities and compete with hotels. Um, so, uh, in, you know, the digital age we live in now, it's so easy just to go on your phone and even with hotels, but Airbnb, Verbo, you're just, you can look anywhere you go and find a place to stay anywhere in the world, really. So you have urban markets and vacation markets are really the two different. Gotcha. Urban markets are going to be a little bit stricter and more common to change or more frequent to change rules and regulations, which are a challenge, but it can also be a significant advantage as an investor. Because if you look at the Smokies, there's just mountains and hills for forever out there. And if there's less regulation or no regulation in much of those counties or cities, then the supply can go up a ton or a quicker rate per se than at a city. Because if there's Let's say there's zoning restrictions like in Nashville. Um, there's almost like a soft cap on the market. You know, you can really only do in commercially zoned er- areas or plan unit developments that go up. So with that being said, and they'll grandfather ran the existing permit holders from before. So if there's a soft cap, but increasing demand, it really helps protect your, your cash flow, um, if you yep. will. Because other areas where the supply goes crazy, but the, the total market revenue doesn't. That's what that article was about, was the mm-hmm. revenue per available listing. Um, even if the revenue is increasing, if supply increases at a faster rate, the total available market share of the revenue per rental actually goes could go down. It doesn't mean yeah. it can't be super profitable there. It just means there's the supply has increased greater than the rental demand. Than the demand, right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because it dropped... So, so it is legitimate when it's when it showed because you know sometimes these things come out and they're not they're skewing yeah. the data. It was it was looking at the, the problem I have with it though is it needs to look at multiple years and multiple months or a year as a whole. So it kind of cherry picked certain markets where the supply did definitely go up a lot um, for sure. Like I think Phoenix and Austin or Phoenix and Sevierville and Austin were like the the top three on there. They looked at May from 2022 to May of 2023 but just those comparing the month over or year over year for just the month of may oh it's it? the rest of the year that's it oh so what they looked at in the, in the article what a lot of people were posting was said revenues down 50 percent. revenue actually was not down 50 percent. if you look it was probably cu- quite the opposite total market revenue if you look on air dna was up significantly it was the revenue per year or per markets Gotcha. Exactly. Revenue per available rental was down because the supply had increased. And you also have to take in consideration that the spring of 22 was probably the end at the end of the peak of the post COVID travel demand. So there was an artificial spike in travel that a lot of investors probably looked at just the 2021 to 2022 data and they were like, oh, this is what it's going to be. So they overpaid for real estate. And now there's greater supply in the market. And a lot of people will probably sell off. We're starting to see supply come down in a couple of those markets. And like I said earlier, supply and demand have a way of figuring itself out long term. Yeah, of course. That was the problem I had with that article was just like it was kind of misleading a little bit. You know, they just looked at one month and one data point um, when it's, you know, it doesn't mean you can't make a bunch of money in those markets. It just means if you set up an average property, it's going to be a race to the bottom because there's right? It's increasing faster than the total revenue is. Gotcha. And would you say even in a market like that, you can go in with an experience and outperform it? Or is that something where you'd probably hold tight in some, seeing that data in some of those markets for the short term before purchasing? I mean, I would, yeah, I would definitely take it into consideration for sure. I mean, there still are, are a lot of price conscious travelers out there, but I would just look like Scottsdale is ultra competitive more so compared to a lot of other markets out there. Scottsdale is a very established market that everyone has a sick pool. Everyone has a putt-putt course. Everyone has, half the places have bachelorette theme. Some have like volleyball courts. So how extreme can you go where the total dollars invested still yields the result you're looking for? Right. For me right now, I I still like Scottsdale as a short-term rental market, but 
there's other markets that are more profitable in my opinion. Um, so it really just depends on each market. Price. Which, uh, which markets do you want to share versus I'm sure you want to keep a couple secret. <laughs> Honestly, um, I get asked like every day by students, by people on social media, by friends. Yeah. What I just want to know what your top market is. Like, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not, I don't have any data necessarily that, that you don't have access to. I just work with students all over the country. And so I, I have the benefit of seeing different markets at different Yeah, you get the ground game. I would say this, if you're going to invest, oh, this is free advice. And if you're listening, like write this down because it's really helpful. The two different markets, you have an urban market and vacation market. An urban market, I would invest in if one, there's already established tourism and it's growing. And then two, the city is growing in population. Because what happens there is it protects your cash flow and the investment in terms of long-term equity and appreciation. If the city is growing and there's a lack of supply, that's going to put an upward pressure on the price of real estate typically, right? Long term. Secondly, if people are moving there, let's say you have to pivot to a midterm rental or a long-term rental. People are always going to be looking. And if there's limited supply, people are moving there with families, maybe for work, right? Whatever it may be, they need to rent for one, two, three, six months at a time. They're going to be looking for a nice furnished rental. So yeah. it kind of protects your investment. It hedges a little bit against any headwinds for short-term rentals. Vacation markets, I just look at all the data on AirDNA. Um, it, it's really easy to look at where the top properties are located, what they offer guests, and just don't try to fix what's not broken. Like don't recreate the wheel. They have already It's already there for you. Um, you can see what the potential is, run multiple scenarios. But in a vacation market, you definitely want to see just steady tourism, hopefully growing. Uh, but do pay attention to the supply and those other factors. And how do you... Um... Obviously, AirDNA, you brought up that site because I was going to mention that next. Um, will it show you the, obviously, it's showing you the number. Is it, it, is it showing you potential permits coming or anything like that? Or is it more just actual data? Yeah, just mostly historical data and some future looking, but it's mostly historical. Um, the one other thing I'll mention for vacation markets, too, is that I really like to focus on is drives to vacation markets uh, are going to probably have less issues during economic hardships or times where, you know, um, the economy struggling. Because if you think about going to the Smoky Mountains or even to the beach on the Panhandle of Florida, once it's drive to from multiple major met metropolitan areas, that's where I would focus on. Because if those metropolitan areas are also growing in population, like Western North Carolina, the mountains, Greenville, South Carolina is growing, Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, all growing, Raleigh and Charlotte, all growing. And where does everyone want to go when they move to a new city? They want to experience like the local vacation spot. So yeah, that helps the demand long term. Um, yeah. So I mean, I would just keep that into consideration, and then yeah, keep an eye on local rules and regulations. You, usually, you can see the writing on the wall, but I would work with a local realtor and network with other investors and see if there's already been permit changes in the past. How aggressive are they? Um, yep. But yeah, of course, that is a risk that you take going into most urban markets. Yeah, makes sense. So between, um, you know, because I'm an apartment guy, we own apartments and we do multifamily, don't do any Air, uh, Airbnbs at this point. But curious, and we it's funny because we have some midterm rentals within our apartment communities that are quite successful. Um, and some people that we've let into sublet and some that we actually run ourselves. Um, how, are you familiar with the apartment space? How do you recommend it in, in comparison to your Airbnbs, it's probably a faster turn in terms of you know revenue and turnover versus kind of that longer term apartment growth. But I'm curious your thoughts between multifamily investing versus Airbnb investing. Yeah, I would say for scaling cash flow as fast as possible and big cash flow, cash and cash return, short term rentals all day long. However, the the biggest the, a couple advantages to doing commercial or multifamily. One, they're appraised differently than single family homes. That's like right. the biggest driver. Because if you go into a single family home, you put in some money into put some money into it, you fix it up, and your rent roll does really well, your NOI goes up. Now that a property, you may have just built yourself a nice seven figure piece of equity just by increasing rents. Um, however, if you do that in short term rentals, it doesn't matter, right? Because they, unless they change that, they're just looking at the three or comps. four best comps in the area to appraise that piece of property, even if it's cash flow on like two hundred k a year, it doesn't matter. Right. So from an equity standpoint, that's where really multifamily and commercial has a huge leg up, in my opinion. Uh, but gotcha. flow-wise, yeah. I mean, you're going to 
it's hard to find anything that beats a short term rental. I think the the beauty, which is I think where this conversation could be could go, is blending the two. And that's where I think you get into hotels or boutique hotels where it's like small multifamily, but there you treat it more as like a contactless boutique hotel. So just multiple little Airbnbs within. Interesting. Because you're seeing conversions happen. Um, even my buddies are doing some of these mini, you know, comfort suite type hotel um conversions into multifamily. So I don't know if they're doing shorter term rentals with that in combination with the longer term 12 month. Um, but that's an interesting idea and model because you're saying go in, maybe take a, a mini hotel that was a hotel with nightly stays and mix it to where you're doing some longer term extended stays, shorter term with like 12 month rentals, like doing a hybrid version. You could do that or just strictly get a 24 unit place and just turn them all into um, short-term rentals so yeah and just run them all smaller units um that's uh, a challenge yeah the only challenge i see in that is the financing side um because i totally get it how, how would you do a financing on a on a go ahead yeah no you're you're, you're yeah you're exactly right it'll be financed as a hotel so it's definitely going to be stiffer especially if you're looking to to you know crank up the noi and pull money out through a refi they're going to want to see a longer history. A lot of them got spooked, and rightfully so, with COVID in the hospitality space because uh, it's not just multifamily, it's hospitality. So uh, the LTVs are going to be definitely uh, lower, a little more aggressive, yeah, quite quite a bit lower, more aggressive from the from the lending side. Yeah. Huh. So would you, but uh, would your uh, lenders be your local regional banks or would, I mean, because you're not probably getting agency debt with that. You're going to, like you said, you're going to be, into that space where your interest rates are maybe a little bit higher. It's, it's financed and looked at like a mini hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of people, and I, I haven't gotten into it yet. It's something I'm probably going to delve into here in the very near future, but my peer said their best luck was with local banks. Yeah. With the local, local regionals. So with the financing on the Airbnbs, are there specific banks that you, that will loan all over the country for that, to, for the acquisition side, or is it still local based? And, um, is it traditional financing? Are you just getting your normal traditional 20% down, 30% down type loans or is it different financing? Yeah. So I would say the majority of the time it's conventional financing. Uh, the one really cool thing about doing short term rentals, a great segue for somebody who's looking to start is if you have a market that you want to visit and, and use the rental yourself, like as a second home, you could do 10% down second home loan. You get way more leverage and you're legally allowed to rent it out when you're not using it. You just have to be careful on, it. don't just go get an investment property and say it's a second home loan because that's where it gets a little, it's pretty gray area. So if you have the intent to use it, you just have to report you know, the revenue or the income to the IRS if you rent more than 14 days a year. Right. Uh, beyond that, you could do 15% or 20% down conventional financing. Um, and once you're tapped, I mean, you can only have up to 10 loans or if you're tapped on DTI, then you'd have to pivot to like a DSCR loan which okay. I, I even got a DSCR loan for 15% down on a $1.5 million purchase price. And they were looking at the Airbnb income through AirDNA Rentalizer. Oh, interesting. I just needed a one-to-one coverage on debt service. Now, was your was it through a traditional bank or was it a normal bank or a different bank, like a commercial bank financing? I'm trying to remember who the lender was, but typically I'll just work with a broker. Um, I David Green's brokerage has been pretty good. Um, Ricardo Carrillo has been kind of like my right hand man. He actually helps coach on the lending side in my my coaching program. So I, will he locate financing all over the country? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yep. Specifically to the Air, Air uh, Airbnb market. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll awesome. do both. I mean, he he financed my primary house too. Um, mm-hmm. So they'll they'll do all all sorts of financing, but they work with a ton of investors. But I mean, they're basically tied to bigger pockets through David. So. Gotcha. They have, you know, that that investor network um, is what I would imagine most of the business is coming from. Yeah, because that's the key too. You go find something, it's called a million dollar property. You're going to put, say, 10, 20% down. So 200 grand or 100,000 uh, financing the rest, but you're going to be doing it as uh, an investment specific. Uh, you can get traditional financing or you can do something a little quicker if there's some other avenues, like you said, through through the broker nationwide. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah. that's interesting. Awesome, man. Um, yeah, that's definitely the way to go. What else, I mean, because obviously I want to talk a little bit about your coaching program um, and, you know, students can find you. 
do you have different levels of these programs where you can kind of get in like a crash course and then maybe one level up and then like a full blown mentorship? Yeah, the main thing we offer is a uh, a mentorship and coaching program. It's six months long, and if you don't have a property up and running within six months, we'll continue to coach you. You know, for up to an, a whole year at no additional cost. Okay. Um, we want everyone to be successful, but it's it's definitely. And I have a ton of my friends are in the space. I would consider it to be the most hands on and mo- uh, highest access to coaching in terms of the Airbnb coaching space. Uh, over thirty coaching calls a month. And then we have about, I want to say seven or eight coaches on the bench. So it's not just me. So we have another investing in Airbnb coach. We have a lending coach, tax, legal, uh, design coaches, um, prop, prop, the CEO of Home Team Vacation Rentals does co-hosting and property management. So a lot of d- different aspects that you can get coaching through. And then, of course, you have 11 or 12 hours plus of uh, video content. That's like the video training course and all the resources. Um, yeah, we've had over a thousand people. Um, been amazing program. so you also have access to that network for for life um, through a group uh, online as well so it's been pretty cool to see it develop and what it's turned into today so you'll do like 30 live kind of trainings that obviously get recorded per month by different you know coaches that are coming on in the different aspects of it correct yep yeah we have like a whole online course that you have lifetime access yep. to and then you get six months access to the 30 plus live coaching calls probably we're we're literally like helping students underwrite properties live on call. So it's not just presentation style. It's, you know, if you were on Justin, you'd be like, Hey, I'm looking at this market, looking at this property. Like let's walk through the details together. Um, so yeah, it's very like uh, done with you kind of teach you how to fish mentality. Yeah. It's very similar to what we've, uh, we've launched on the multifamily side, right. With, uh, you know, people wanting to get into that space. Cause I, and we, we, this is why I asked you the question between Airbnb versus multifamily flipping wholesaling, because I, I'm sure you get it a lot in potential students coming on is they are seeing all these gurus online and they're getting you know pulled in different directions of oh because they're just looking for the how do i get some revenue and money going right and the faster the better um but with that comes understanding that there's different aspects where if you're doing wholesaling and flipping it's more transactional right you're just going to get into the hamster wheel you can do well but it's very transactional and you're always going to be chasing the next deal for that. You get into the Airbnb, you're looking at, okay, you're going to get more cash flow driven, more financial freedom, uh, maybe better cash on cash returns. Uh, there's some risk with it, um, but definite opportunities there. And I think that's why you've seen a huge rush into that too. Uh, and, and kind of people try to jump on that ship. And then you have the multifamily side, which you know, definitely bigger numbers, bigger zeros. If you're getting into the larger stuff, um, longer i mean massive benefits from the tax side uh obviously like you said appreciation inflationary hedges um cash flow side of it and there's but it's bigger barriers to entry and it's not going to be that fast burn flip turn cash flow tomorrow and rock and roll and you're a gazillionaire it is a slower less sexy thing (laughs) i tell people but if you if you're if you like six figures great then maybe wholesaling flipping Airbnbs. If you like seven and eight figures, then multifamily. And it just depends on where you want to go and the avenues in which you know, you're willing to take. And like you said, I think a blend between, I mean, I look at the different business models, Airbnb and multifamily all day long, or even putting into that, like, cause we're in the storage, um, uh, multi, um, mobile home parks. And, uh, we like that model. And you know, we're looking into flex space and storage facilities. That's all part of the commercial stuff, but similar to multifamily it's all cash flow driven um but i'd like to get your thoughts real quick on that and we can finish on it but when you do see all the people coming in that want to learn the side of this and they're probably asking similar questions like hey i've been looking at wholesaling and flipping houses and learning courses about that and now i'm looking at oh airbnbs and that i get it all the time you know how can i get cash flow going and turn it in the next 30 days. I'm like, well, <laughs> a little more challenging in the multifamily, but I said the long-term gain is better, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, for me, I looked at wholesaling and even flipping and there's a ton more risk in flipping than there are typically in, in investing and, and cash flow uh, wise. Wholesaling is a grind for a lot of people, like it's tough. Um, 
if you get really good at it and build a great team and systems, which takes longer than a lot of people make it sound online, then yeah, you can make quite a bit of money. But like you said, it's transactional. So you're you're going to spend the majority of the next several years, I would say five to 10 years where you're still, it's like another job. I mean, you're trading a ton of time for it. Um, I always like to say Eric, short-term rentals are the fastest path to financial freedom because it, of course, like anything, right? If you do it right, a single property can cash flow you three, five, 10 plus thousand dollars a month. Um, so there is, there's really nothing else that can produce that level of cash flow. Uh, it is more involved though, right? I mean, you have to furnish it, design it, and then the ongoing management piece. Um, and, but long-term, I, that's where the blend of multifamily or commercial comes into where you want to plant some money and let your net worth really skyrocket. That's where I think you take the cash flow and move. But if you're looking to like quit your job as fast as possible, that's Usually it's very goal oriented and driven, right? And same yeah. for you. It depends what people, like, what's your short-term goal? What's your long-term goal? If you are like, hey, I would just love to retire my wife or my husband. I want to spend more time with my kids or I just want an extra 5K a month. I'm like, dude, just start with one or two short-term rentals and just do it the right way. You'll do really well. And then once you have the time freedom, now you can explore any other opportunity. You want to scale a big short-term rental portfolio? Awesome. If you want to plant that money in multifamily, and just scale that way. Awesome. Um, but that's the way I view it. I mean, for me, I think their true money is to be made by holding and and through cash flowing assets. So, yeah. Like you said, the transactional stuff. And then it's just a tough market to flip in right now. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I just went to, uh, you know, Kent Clothier, uh, he's got his boardroom mastermind and I know him a little bit. And there was a lot of wholesalers and flippers there. And every single one of them, it's like, I'm getting murdered right now. There's, you know, there's, cause once again, if there's lower barriers to entry, you know, everybody online is a guru. Everybody's coming into it. Right. And then now you have this massive supply of people trying to do it and you don't have that much supply of properties to do it with. And so you just have to spend massive and disrupt her stuff. Yeah. And everybody's just getting hammered in that space right now. So I, I've always advised against it, at least for, for the, for the moment. Would would you say that uh, Airbnbs are getting? Is it too late to get in that game, or not really? I don't think so. I think it's very market dependent, though. Right? I mean, if you go into the market that had the most significant growth, um, especially like a post COVID market where you started to see crazy travel numbers in a market that historically did not have those numbers, and then it's starting to come back down to pre COVID levels, and price of real estate like doubled in a couple of years, which is there maybe more. Which is nuts. Um, yeah, off, a lot of people great bought in those markets. Yeah, and 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 now where the numbers don't make sense based on the pre-COVID numbers. So it just depends on it's market specific, property specific. But like, I just bought my most recent property a couple months ago, and it's you know next month we're going to bring in forty grand on a single property and net. net That's gross rev through twenty seven. Yeah. yeah. So we'll net can this- like twenty seven thousand dollars on a single place. Now, granted, this is our seventh. It's our biggest and baddest one. We invested a lot of money into it, but. That's the type, and it was a sub million dollar purchase price to do those kinds of numbers. Like, would you say su- sub million purchase price? Yeah, we bought it at nine hundred eighty thousand. We did okay. sink a good bit of money into it, um, but uh, it's it's just wild. Would you put like a it was a was it one hundred fifty thousand in reno to it? I mean, or more? Uh, let's see. We put about twenty six percent down. It was like two fifty or two sixty five, and then all in we were like five eighty or five ninety. Okay, so. You can do the math. I want to say furniture and design, we were about 100 to 110. And then the reno, and we added a lot too. It wasn't just the reno. Like we put a sport court on the driveway for a full court basketball court. We put like a four hole putt putt. This is a big house. Big house. 6,800 square foot, sleeps 20 people. Uh, Wait, where's it at? <laughs> it's, in Ash- yeah, it's in Asheville, North Carolina. But- okay. Yeah. Is, is, is it in, uh, is that, I presume that's a vacation market, correct? Yeah, the thousand market, tons of weddings. Yeah, booming market and growing too in population and popularity. But um, yeah, year round, spring's popular, summer's popular. People want to see the fall colors. Go to the Biltmore for the holidays, and we're right right near that, and right near downtown Ash, not too far from downtown Asheville. So and growing market outside, right? Like I said before, Greenville's like an hour and a half away. Greenville's bustling town. Charlotte, Raleigh, all growing, and then same with the Tennessee cities. All growing in that. And did you find that market through data research, or did you just know it because you're kind of in that and been there a while? Us uh, definitely more so the latter, but 
um, as time went on, the numbers still have to make sense. So I started to do a lot more research into it. Some of my previous students um, invested there and they're crushing it. I'm like, mm. man. <laughs> You're like, ah, I think the mentor needs to go in there now too. I know. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to wait for like the right opportunity there. I wanted a value add property that we could like be the top. I want to be the top property there, which I think we have pretty good potential to be top producing property just because no one else has the amenities we, we offer. So that's what I'm really focused on now is now that our cash flow is great, businesses are doing well, I want to just like hit home runs with short-term rentals and just like, I want everybody who looks at Asheville to be, just dream about renting that place. Going to your house. That's how we're able to charge one, 2000 2500 a night for it. And you'll get, if somebody that's going in there, is that a single family or two families with just that are combining together to rent that thing? Uh, I'd probably say probably multiple families, whether it's like, you know. Or big parties with kids or wedding parties, right, that are going to stay there or big friend groups, birthday, birthday, 60th birthday parties we had the other day book. We had somebody book for like 2K a night for six nights out next June. So like people are booking pretty far in advance. Someone asked about October 2024. Oh my God, are you serious? Crazy, man. Yeah. Wow. You're telling me, oh, Airbnb's dying. It's like, no, it's just like getting killed by bad supply. So like if you do really well, like people will always travel and seek experiences, you know? Yes, I, I agree. People were dying to get out and go do something. And it is market specific. It is very market specific. And so you're saying do good re- do good research first. I mean, that's critical. It's, it's like any piece of investment is location. And, and then doing your research on, on the data, the market, the supply, uh, you know, rents. Um, it's interesting when you it's said all that, right there for you, it's all right there online, like air DNA, these other data, data sites, like democratize short-term rental investing for the everyday person and everyday investor. We have, everyone has access to the data. If you just pay a little bit to access it. For their yeah. What are the top three sites you use air DNA? Air DNA for market re- like for, uh, data within markets. Um, yeah. and then I would say like on, it's more so on the back end sites, um, tech for managing property. So that's the other thing is you can self-manage to at scale almost. You can outsource cleaning and then you just have tech. Like so property management software is the biggest one. We use Guest Deeper Pros for the management company, but there's a ton out there. Yep. Um, Price Labs or Wheelhouse for dynamic pricing to help you understand what people, what the demand will actually buy at, right? And then Turno or Resort Cleaning for cleaners. And then everything kind of syncs. Um, so we have seven properties and we haven't been to six. Uh, does everything uh, sync into Guest Because Guest is a decent one I've seen. Um, for for managing that platform, does, does all the uh, like the resort cleaning and everything, uh, whether you're doing I guess maintenance or cleaning, will it sink into that? That's right. Yep. So yeah, so cleaners should know as soon as you get a reservation, they know when it is, they accept it, and then they know when to go, then clean the property checklist, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I don't gotcha. think too like Airbnb, Verbo, Direct Booking, Booking dot com. So if you get a reservation on one, it'll block the other calendars, um, and it'll unified inbox, so it'll automate 90% of your guest messaging from there too. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, there's one last question I had for you. Oh, what are you doing for the 4th of July, man? <laughs> what do you, so yeah, today we're here Friday, you got the weekend and then you got the 4th. I'm just curious, uh, any big plans? Yeah. Got some friends coming out from town and well, I live on a lake out here uh, in South Carolina. So we just got a, a boat, like a wake surfing and wakeboarding boat. Not too long ago. I put getting off a boat for so many years. Delayed gratification, man. I wanted a boat since I was like a teenager. <laughs> Finally got one. And for waiting, I actually got like a pretty sweet boat, like one I've really wanted. Um, but we just love it. Love it. Is it a uh, come out. go fast boat or is it a wakeboard boat? It's a wake surf boat. So yeah, so Mastercraft X24 and beautiful. Uh, it's pretty sick. Yeah, the screen, it's like, what size wave do you want? What speed do you want? You <laughs> I just built Isn't it like crazy. Surf. Um, yeah, it's wild. That's far more advanced than the ones we, cause I mean, we've had a lot of boats and you know, I, I hate to tell you that you will have them and you will sell them. Um, cause you know, boat stands for break out another thousand, right? That's what it stands for. Break out another thousand, but listen, you'll love it. You'll have so much fun with the family. You'll enjoy it. You'll sell it in a few years. It's pretty standard. Uh, and then you'll end up getting another one just cause, You'll forget about how much it costs you. It's like having another kid. You're like, oh, that was painful, but we'll do it again. And then you just, I mean, we've done it. You know, you love it. You enjoy it. Um, and why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So doing that and then we'll go into town. There's a concert in town. I think uh, 
Is it Justin Turner? I don't know. Someone's coming to Greenville, so we'll go watch him and maybe go golf and to hang out on the boat again, watch some fireworks. What about you? Yeah, Carolina is a great market for multifamily, by the way, the North and the South Carolinas. So we're not over on the East Coast yet, um, but you know we're as far north as Tennessee. So we like Nashville, Knoxville, those little pockets. You know, Alabama, Arkansas, and then we're in the kind of the middle part of the country, everywhere from Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up to Missouri. Um, and a little bit of the, the Western side with Arizona and Nevada. Um, but, uh, one of these days we'll get over to the East coast. It's just, it's another time zone, another flight. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Where can people find you? Uh, uh so any social media, Instagram is probably the best, you know, shoot me a DM there. I always respond. Yeah. Um, it's at M Elefante six. And how many followers across all the platforms do you have now between YouTube, TikTok, Instagram? I think Instagram, you have over 300,000 people, right? Yeah, it's close. It's approaching 300,000. We're 290 somewhere. Wow. And TikTok, like 924,000. Holy cow. Slower burn. Yeah. So about 1.2 yeah. or 1.3 million across all platforms. Yeah. YouTube is a slower burn for sure. What would you say was the biggest thing into getting, uh, did you ever see like a spike when it like went from here to like hero pretty quick? I've posted probably thousands of videos from TikTok and Instagram, and I would dedicate 98% of my follower base came from five videos. Really? Yeah, it's wild, man. I remember posting one a couple back-to-back where I got several million views on TikTok. And I was just talking about my properties and the cash flow. Just just like, hey, super transparent. If you guys are interested, this is how much my property's made, and here's why. Broke through the numbers. And a lot of love and a lot of hate, but that's what creates a great video. Went viral, and I woke up to like 120,000 more followers. And <laughs> the next day, I woke up to another 100,000 followers. This is TikTok, right? So, yeah, it's just wild. And then Instagram just did not hit for the longest time. And then I had one video that took me from, again, hundreds of videos. I had one that did really well. It took me from like 35,000 to 125,000 in a week. Holy pause again. So that's why consistency is key. Yeah, you, know, I, you get so burnt out for posting videos, but you have to try new things, see what works well, see what's working well for other people. And then when you have one that works, just beat that exact style of video into the ground over and over and over again. And, you know, you're, some of your audience may get tired of it. And, oh, you post the same thing every day. And I just <laughs> take that like personally. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Like I'll, I'll post some other stuff, you know, and then, <laughs> but you got to treat every video, especially on TikTok and reels like it's a brand new audience brand new pair of eyes every time so that's what helped me grow but you have to try different things if something's not working don't do it over and over again and watch it still not work you know but yeah it's a finicky social media is such a finicky thing so you're saying because i am not on tiktok because i'm like i have so many plat i mean between youtube instagram i'm not even on facebook i mean i'm on facebook but i don't look at facebook anymore um yeah so, t- I mean, but I just don't know. I mean, but clearly it's working for you. Yeah. And you'd be surprised for, for business, for your coursework. I mean, you just have to get in front of people and, and for, for the people that it's the right fit for, you can help them. Just, it's just another avenue for them to find you. Uh, but there's sure. a lot of people on TikTok for sure. Um, no, I know. I mean, platform now. It's every video, regardless of your following you know, it, it treats it really like the same way. It's less like a dedicated audience like Instagram or especially YouTube is. So each video goes out to like call it 10 people. If the data makes sense, though, this is why TikTok grew so, so much in popularity because if the video did well for those 10 people, it would go to like 100 people. If it did well for 100 people, it would go to 1,000 people. So you get view, you, you get view, your massive viewship, yeah. You would, exactly. You turn on your phone. If it hit the algorithm right, you would turn it turn it back on in an hour and it would have 5,000 views. You'd turn it off. You'd turn it on the next day and it'd be at like 100,000 views. And the next day it'd be like in a million. So it just like goes nuts. But if one doesn't hit, you could have 900,000 followers like I do and one gets 1,200 views. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, I got so it. Finicky. Instagram's more consistent. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Very cool. Well, thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming on. I know we're all, you're a busy man. So, um, and yeah, definitely go uh, meet and see Michael Elefante and everything he's doing with Airbnbs and anything else. Are you looking into other investment styles other than the short-term stuff or just that right now? Yeah, there's some other stuff in the pipeline, um, probably in boutique hotels. I also have some interesting uh, things uh, I would love to pursue in multifamily. I'm just looking for the right partner on that specific venture. So maybe you and I will talk offline because I have something that may interest you. Uh, Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Signing off. Thank you.